now, Betty Fuller, who is the vice president, and she's in charge of programs. <laughs> and I'm delighted to see all the members here, but also the guests, the people, former employees, and current employees of Balfour. Balfour was the name in Attleboro. People said Balfour, they said, oh, Attleboro. So it's fitting that we are here tonight to honor that celebration of Balfour and Company. <coughs> and it's great because everywhere you went, not just Attleboro, not just Massachusetts, but throughout the country, the name Balfour meant something, whether it was rings or fraternal pins or jewelry, it was <coughs> Balfour, and Balfour was Attleboro, and that was history. And it's sad to say that we don't have Balfour here, right here where we had it on County Street, but we have the River Park, and oftentimes if you're in the park area, you'll say, oh yeah, I remember coming here or going into the, one woman said tonight, oh yeah, in the office here of Mr. Balfour, she said the wooden floors because the floors in the property <coughs> were wooden floors. But all of those things. So we're looking forward to having some of you who were formerly employed there could give us a few memories, and we hope you will share them. But George Shelton, who is the director of our museum here, the Industrial Museum, and he is going to present us tonight with some of the history of Balfour and he has artifacts here and newsletters. I think it was Mr. Ellis, who was the president of the Gold Dusters, the one uh, dropped some things off here of the Balfour. So you may want to look at those later, but George will tell you more about that. So without further ado, George Shelton from the Attleboro Industrial Museum. <coughs> Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm trying out the new PA system, so if it's too loud, do this. If it's not loud enough, do this. Uh, nice. I never worked at Balfour. Uh, I never knew Mr. Balfour. But we do have a large collection of Balfour uh, artifacts, uh, documents, uh, and so I had a lot that I could use to uh, to research the man. Uh, and he was a, a really large influence on the city of Attleboro uh, and the Balfour Company, of course. So we're going to kind of go back and forth. I'm gonna, we're going to have a little trivia. I'm going to ask you uh, some questions about him. Uh, uh, how many people worked at Balfour? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And how many people have someone in their family who worked at Balfour? Well, that's just about everybody who's here. I knew that was the case. I knew you were interested in Mr. Balfour. It isn't me. I can't get three people together to talk to him. Uh, but yeah, a uh, lot of memories over the, the time that it was here, 80 something years from 1913 to 1996, Attleboro had the Balfour Company here. That's a long time for a lot of good memories, maybe some bad memories, uh, but certainly a, a major force in the city of Attleboro. Started out with five employees, including Mr. Balfour. At its height, it had something like 2,500 employees. So it was certainly a successful business. Uh, and. and run in a way that uh, I guess you don't really see too often anymore. So we're going to talk about Mr. Balfour himself first. Uh, Mr. L.G. Balfour was born on January 7th, uh, 1886. Uh, and my question is, does anybody know where he was born? Yeah. No. <laughs> I didn't either. Uh, in fact, I had been going around for years telling people the wrong place. And the reason I did that is because uh, there was a 50-year anniversary book put out uh, on Balfour's 50th anniversary, and it had a big page about Mr. Balfour, and in there it said he was a native of Louisville, Kentucky. So I thought he was born in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we have a Balfour exhibit out there, for example. It has one of those things, you know, you push the button and it tells you about the exhibit. On that exhibit, it tells you he was from uh, Kentucky. 
No, he wasn't. He was born in a town called Wausau, Ohio. Uh, I didn't know that. But he did move, his family did move to Louisville. So he was uh, raised in Louisville, uh, went to high school in Louisville. Uh, he graduated from high school in 1904 in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I get the feeling, without having seen these report cards, that uh, he was a good student, but not a great student. He, you know, he wasn't the class valedictorian or anything, uh, but he was obviously well liked. He was president of his class. Uh, he lettered in uh, three sports, in uh, football, baseball, and basketball, oh, and also track, he ran track. So he was a very active athlete in high school. Uh, let me show you, there he is. Again, he graduated from high school in 1904. This, pic this is a picture of him in 1905, freshman uh, at the uh, University of Louisville. So he was a good looking young man, don't you think? Uh, 1905, so this is his starting off on his, uh, his degree, his BA degree from the University of Louisville. Uh, then, here he is again. In 1907, uh, and at this time he was uh, attending uh, Indiana University. After he got his BA, uh, he went on uh, to law school, and he actually got a, a degree in law from the University uh, of Indiana. Uh, and he earned a varsity letter there in football and baseball. Uh, and. I'm going to tell you some of the anecdotes that I found, and I hope you have some to share with us later, too, uh, about your time with it. But this is about him himself. Uh, he wrote of a time, I, I got the impression, the definite impression, that uh, Mr. Balfour had a great time in college uh, because he always really loved colleges and went to a business related to colleges. And he later, in, in later years, when he was successful, supported colleges. Uh, because he just uh, really appreciated that life. Uh, but uh, in, in my looking at his papers, he was recalling himself a time uh, when he was playing baseball for uh, Indiana University. And uh, at the end of the game, irate fans from the opposing team chased him out of town. And he said he had to jump on the back of a caboose of a train leaving town to escape the irate fans of, uh, I hope they beat them, I mean, why else would they be irate, uh, from the baseball team. So uh, he obviously had an active time when he was in, when he was in college. Uh, so he graduated from uh, Indiana University, and in 1906, at 20 years old, went looking for a job, not as a lawyer. Maybe he decided it wasn't for him. Maybe there weren't any lawyer jobs. I'm not sure why. Uh, but interestingly, he got a job for a company called Burr Patterson Company of Columbus, Ohio, and they made fraternity jewelry, you know, fraternity pins and fraternity rings and sorority pins. Uh, so he got a job as a salesman, traveling salesman. Uh, and for five years, he worked for this company as a salesman. And what he observed while doing that is that uh, it wasn't done very well. He felt that uh, there was a lot that could be improved in this fraternity and sorority uh, jewelry area. He said it, that the stuff that they had available was poorly made, that the service was bad, they didn't deliver on time. This is his company, I mean, this is his, his own company. And at the end of five years, he felt that he could do better. So he, uh, he decided that he would. In 1912, he came to Attleboro and went to work for the Robbins Company. Robbins Company of Attleboro was also making fraternity jewelry. They had a fraternity division. And uh, he came on as head of sales because he had five years' experience of sales. Now, while he was there, he met 
George Nerney, a name that's also familiar in Attleboro. Uh, and Mr. Nerney was the head designer at the Robbins Company. Now, they must have hit it off together uh, because about a year later, Mr. Balfour and Mr. Nerney had a uh, falling out with Mr. Robbins. Over what? I don't know. But he had worked for Robbins for almost a year. And he and Mr. Nerney decided to take a shot at creating their own company. So uh, they had some capital and they incorporated the LG Balfour Company on June 13th, 1913. So almost 100 years from today, and on June it will be 100 years. Uh, they found a little bit of space in a loft, in a, in a loft area of the Bigney Building. Does everybody know where the Bigney Building is? Some of you do, maybe some of you don't, but yeah, uh, it's uh, not far from here. It's on County and Wall, right, the corner of County and Wall, and that's where today the, uh, the appliance store is. And it's just across the street from uh, Cumberland Farms, where I get all my gas. So that building uh, is where they first set up. So that was it, right there. Uh, they were up in the top there, and uh, that water tower actually says Balfour on it. Uh, I think that's the back of the big neat building. Uh, and it was certainly looking different at the time. I think this tower right here was the Universalist Church, which was located in what's now the parking lot across from Moran's Restaurant. So, you know, it's just down from there. So it, I think it was, in fact, the Bigney Building, but uh, uh, a, back, a back view of it. So anyway, they move into the uh, loft area. Uh, in addition to the two owners, they hire three people. So we're going to have a five-man company here. Uh, they hired a die cutter, a stone setter, and a tool maker. And that was their company. Uh, the total payroll for the company when it started per week for all five of them was uh, $90 a week. <laughs> and Mr. Balfour, being the owner and founder, uh, received 35 bucks. They had zero orders. When they founded the company, they had zero business, none. So Mr. Balfour had to get out there and start scratching around. Uh, but he did have this six years of sales uh, experience in the fraternity area. And uh, on October 1st, 1914, so from June to October, no business. The first order came in from the Gamma Delta fraternity by Gamma Delta uh, was their first order. But uh, more contracts followed very quickly. For three years, Mr. Balfour was the only salesman. In 1916, the sales force grew to six. So they had six salesmen, including Mr. Balfour. But they developed a reputation for a superior product and superior service. They made a beautiful product and they delivered on time at the price they said they would deliver. And as anyone could know, that's the key to success, is happy customers. And so uh, the company began to grow. Now here's something I did not know. Mr. Balfour was married in 1913 to a woman called Ruth de Haas. Now Ruth died of pneumonia in 1919. I did not realize that he had been married twice, uh, but uh, that was news to me, but maybe not to you. Uh, but in 1921, he remarried to a woman named Mildred, Mc Mildred McCain, and Mildred was his wife until, until he died. Uh, the Balfours lived, well, in, who knows where the Balfours lived? Anybody? Where? They're in Norton. Uh, anybody know where in Norton? Pine Street, right, Pine Street, Norton, and they lived in a log cabin on a working farm, the Balfour Farm. So, but lest you think they lived like Daniel Boone, here is their log cabin in a couple of interior shots. It was not exactly, you know, uh, it wasn't exactly primitive, but uh, 
quite a lovely place, actually. But they did uh, live on a, on a working farm. Uh, were very interested in, in animals as well. They had horses and they had, uh, cow, uh, they had goats. I'm not sure if they had cows or not, but uh, certainly horses and goats. Uh, riding horses, Mr. Balfour was interested in thoroughbreds, uh, owned some thoroughbreds, had a favorite. I could not remember the name of his horse, his favorite horse. But interestingly, he had some of the craftsmen at the company make a silver a silver uh, model of his horse. So that was his actual thoroughbred that modeled for this uh, silver thing. And then once they had all these dyes, this horse was used on all of the equestrian uh, trophies that the company made. So the horse on the trophies for equestrian events that Alvaro made was actually Mr. Balfour's horse. Now, in 1922 was when Balfour began to manufacture high school rings. And high school graduation rings became their premier product. The product they were most known for was high school rings. And in 1922, uh, they were, anybody know what the process they used then? What kind of process they used to make the rings when they first started making them? Dye striking, Dye striking right. And that means they look like this. The die was made to stamp them, and they were flat. Then these things were taken and rolled into a ring shape. Uh, a lot of engineering there. In the center here, there's a piece that goes in, a, a concave piece, designed so that when the ring was bent into a circle, that concave piece became flat. So it came out perfectly flat, and that's where they could mount the, the center piece with the stone onto it, uh, and it would be soldered together uh, in a way, of course, that you could not possibly see. Uh, they designed a different die for each individual school. So they didn't have four or five models that they, you know, just changed the number or the name. Or the, they made a specific die for each school. Uh, so if your school uh, sports team were the, uh, uh, the Bobcats, your ring could have a bobcat on it, the name of the city, the graduation year, uh, and perhaps your own name, and a stone of your choice. So they, they offered, like I said, a superior product. They made, they made a beautiful product. Uh, and die striking went on until uh, sometime around the 50s or 60s, 60s, when they changed to a different process, which was what? Casting, Casting yeah, they cast them. They made uh, wax impressions of the rings and made a, a mold with the wax casting, melted out the wax, filled in the metal, and uh, the rings were, were round to begin with, and then finished off. So they, they had a, a couple of different techniques over their, over their time. Uh, they made a lot of rings, uh, sports rings as well. Uh, they made all kinds. I wanted to show you this one here. This was from a high school in Texas in 1981. What size is a small ring? A five, okay. What size is a large ring, a men's ring? A large men's ring, would you say? 13 is probably a pretty big ring. This was for a high school senior in Texas, 22 and a half. <laughs> Largest ring that Balfour ever made. Uh, and again, a high school senior. Uh, it's, so that, that's in our, in our collection. A 22 and a half. Uh, well, Balfour's outgrew the, building, the Bigney building in 1923, and they moved across the street to the former Bates and Bacon building, which became the Balfour building that we all know and love in, on County Street. Uh, that one. That was when it was Bates and Bacon. Uh, and it was, again, right on County. This, you can see 23. County Street is a dirt road uh, when Bates and Bacon is there. Uh, this is probably before 1923, but 
So that's the building that they originally moved into on County Street. Uh, they were successful business because they, they, they were very innovative. They kept looking for new products, new ways to, uh, to get into different markets. Uh, again, they were very successful with the rings uh, but, and with the, uh, with the college products. But they were always looking for new customers. So uh, in 1924, for example, they expanded into products for the Masonic Lodges, for the Eastern Star, which was the uh, ladies' version, uh, the Knights of Columbus, the Elks, and they started making hospital nursing uh, pins and badges. Uh, again, always looking for, for new things. Uh, in 1925, they started producing corporate service products, so, you know, 10-year uh, uh, service pins or 15 years without an accident or uh, that kind of uh, corporate jewelry products. In 1928, they started a paper division where they made uh, things like diplomas and all kinds of uh, uh, fancy paper products. Uh, by, the, by 1928, Mr. Balfour had bought out Mr. Nerney and was the sole owner of L.G. Balfour. In 1930, the Balfour Company purchased the Burr, Patterson, and All Company. Sound familiar? Do you remember what I just said when he first started? This is the company he started with. The company that he said made crappy stuff. <laughs> so maybe it was satisfying to him to buy the company that he started out in uh, and hopefully, you know, bring it up to par. So uh, it was bought, it was operated as a separate company, but both owned by Mr. Balfour. Uh, so I'm sure there was a lot of, uh, of fraternization there. Uh, so much so that in 1961, the Balfour Company was sued for, uh, for operating a, uh, basically, uh, a monopoly. Between those two companies, they held 85% of the fraternity jewelry market in the United States. Uh, and other companies were upset because one of, the, one of their, the things that they did was they would go to these fraternities, uh, to, their, to their headquarters, and they would sign these long-term contracts, exclusive contracts, and for multiple years so that the fraternities would agree to only purchase from Balfour's. And in return, they would, uh, they would give them part of the, of the profits back uh, and guarantee, you know, they, they made a beautiful product and it was on time and they, they gave them great service, but uh, they were sued by some companies who wanted to get into that business and simply could not because of these contracts. Uh, this suit, this unfair trade practice suit, went on for 10 years. Uh, actually, a little more, from 1961 until 1972, when Balfour actually lost the suit. And at that time, uh, they had to sell the Burr, Patterson, and All Company, which they did. Uh, so that, that cut into their, uh, their business. I'm sure they, they got a decent price for it, but it wasn't the same thing. They were not controlling then this large part of the, of the business. Uh, during uh, World War II, like most of the companies, Balfour produced uh, items for the war. Uh, things like instrument dials, military nameplates, and of course all kinds of insignias, uh, which is what they were, were asked to do. Now in the, in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, uh, someone asked me that already. When, you know, when was their real height? When was the height of the company? And the research I did said that's when. Late 50s into the 60s, the baby boomers. After World War II, all the soldiers came home and had lots of babies. And when are they going to go to college? And when are they going to be graduating from high school? In late 50s, early 60s. So the, the ring business and the, uh, the college business uh, was very strong at that time. Uh, so they prospered. 
Several additions to the building were made. Uh, the newspaper did a, a retrospective uh, on Balfour at one point, and they talked about the building and people's memories, and they said they had great memories of working in that building on County Street, but that the building stunk. <laughs> that it was all divided up, it was not very well organized, that uh, you know, it, it didn't flow like, a, like most companies should have, uh, because they put addition on here and addition on there and addition on here, and they had an original old building. So they said, yeah, the building was, was not a great building, but the company was a great company. Uh, and just this location alone, you know, sitting on the side of the river, flooding was, was a, a pretty common event, uh, just like it is still today. Uh, every few years, uh, you would have some kind of a flooding situation, and uh, they would have to deal with that. Uh, but they had other buildings. They had buildings in North Attleboro. They had buildings in, uh, they had, uh, buildings in Canada, in Ontario, I believe. They had buildings in Texas. Uh, so they had expanded out, as I said. So at one point, according to the research I saw, they were employing 2,500 people. Uh, up from five. Uh, and the die struck rings uh, were given up in, in the 60s era. Uh, the cast rings were brought in and I, I guess that allowed certain uh, kinds of designs to be done that couldn't be done well with die striking. So uh, it allowed them to produce an even uh, a more attractive product. Uh, by 1960, Mr. Balfour was 74. Uh, he was 74 years old. He was ready to retire as president of the company. He was still head of the board of directors. He was still the owner. He was still the guy. But day-to-day -day president operations were turned over to uh, Robert Yeager. And some of you probably worked under Mr. Yeager. Uh, Mr. Balfour passed away on July 12th. 1973, at 87. Uh, he died at home. Uh, his wife, Mildred, lived for another 10 years. Um, he was a person, uh, from what I understand, uh, and, and again, from, from the research that I've done, uh, that was a real people person, that he could go down into the factory and he knew the names of the people who were working for him, and he would talk to them and, and uh, spend time with them. Uh, he would, when he had the uh, annual dinner that uh, he would walk around the room and sit down with this table and talk with these people and then sit down at this table and talk with these employees. Uh, he certainly was civic minded. He did a lot for the city of Attleboro. Uh, he brought uh, all kinds of performances to the city. Uh, the one that, that uh, the newspapers reported a great deal on was the uh, Mormon Tabernacle Choir, well, yeah, which you probably, that's probably 150 people. Uh, that they brought here. So, you know, it was not a cheap kind of thing to do. Uh, the company had uh, all kinds of sports programs. There was company bowling league, there was basketball, there was softball, there was golf. Uh, the company really seemed to care about their people. Uh, uh, Mr. Balfour made a, a, a great effort during the, uh, during the Depression to keep the people that he had in his factory working, uh, even if it meant less profit for the company. Now today a company cannot really do that if they're, if they're publicly owned because they have to owe, answer to shareholders and the shareholders don't like it when the profits go down and they get less money. But Mr. Balfour was a sole owner. He could do whatever he wanted and what he chose to do was keep people working uh, and exhorted his, his salesman during the Depression to get out there, find some business for us, because we want to keep everybody working. Uh, so he was, it appears he was very beloved in the city. And when he did pass away, when his wife did pass away, company ownership was left in trust. So a trust ran uh, the company for some time. And then it finally was, did become a public company. It was bought and went on the, uh, on the stock market and people had shares, and again, that changes the way the company has to respond uh, to its shareholders. And the company uh, left Attleboro in 1996. Operations were, were uh, moved from here to Texas, and the Attleboro factory was, was taken down. Uh, 
Again, that's a view, another view of the, uh, the building. That's Mr. Yeager. Uh, I had some pictures of the, uh, the smokestack being knocked down, but I decided it was too sad. Uh, so I didn't put them in there. But when the factory was taken down, of course, it was turned into the Balfour Riverwalk, Riverwalk Park, which we are all familiar with today. Uh, Mr. Balfour also, in his, in his lifetime, uh, created the Balfour Charitable Foundation, which is still exists today. Uh, and it is a, a foundation that uh, names specific uh, organizational kinds of things uh, that would have preference, and it was mostly Attleboro kinds of things. The Attleboro Foundation for a long time gave a lot of scholarship money to the, to the children of employees and former employees, uh, and supported uh, various uh, civic activities, which they still do today. I know they're major, they've done some major contributing to the YMCA. They've made con major con contributions to the, uh, the hospital, the fire department, and this museum. Uh, and we have been uh, recipients of, of grants from, from the Balfour Foundation. So even after Mr. Balfour's passing, he still has been a, a positive influence on our city. Uh, well, I've, I've got a couple of, of little anecdotes about Mr. Uh, Balfour, and then I want to I wanna open it up to your, your impressions of working for Balfour and people that you knew at Balfour and uh, various stories. But I'm going to tell you... Uh, Three, three little anecdotes that I came across concerning him. And one had to do, at one time, uh, the Balfour Company uh, owned Highland Country Club. They owned it. And uh, that's where they had their dinners and so forth. I don't know when they, when they stopped owning it, when someone else owned it. But uh, anyway, Mr. Balfour was a, uh, was a golfer and uh, played frequently at Highland Country Club. And he was a stickler for punctuality. He wanted to be on time, and uh, so the story goes that uh, his foursome varied at one time or another uh, between Mr. Yeager, uh, Ray Wells, Tom Galvin, Bob Green, and Bucky Gay. These were people that eventually, that in various combinations, made up his foursome. So the story goes that uh, tee-off time was one of those moments when Balfour was at his most insistent about being on time. So it said he would drive up at the last minute, meet his caddy, and if tee off time was 9 a.m., that's when he started, 9 a.m. Well, one morning they were ready to tee off, and Mr. Yeager wasn't there yet. And so uh, one of the other members of the foursome, uh, Mr. Balfour got ready to put his ball down and he was ready to go. And one of the members of the foursome said to him, well, what about Buzz Yeager, who was then the president of Balfour? And uh, Mr. Balfour, his response is he growled, the hell with him, he can tell time. <laughs> <laughs> and off they went without Mr. Yeager. Once he was being interviewed on, on the uh, Attleboro radio station, and uh, the question was asked to him, they said, well, if you had to guess, how many people would say, would you say are working for you now? So he thought for a minute, he said, maybe half of them. <laughs> <laughs> now I came across another story about the Balfour Company while Mr. Balfour was there. Uh, and I remembered it, I, I thought it was really interesting and, and kind of uh, spoke to who the guy was, but I couldn't find it. So I'm going to tell you the story, but I can't swear to it. Okay, maybe you know about it. Hopefully uh, you will remember this story as well. But apparently there was a whole department that repaired rings that people sent back. If something happened to a ring, Balfour was wonderful about standing behind their product. If, you, if your Balfour ring got damaged, they would send, you could send it back and they would fix it for nothing and send it back to you. So they had a whole department that did that. Well, rings started to disappear from the department. I see somebody who knows what's this story. So rings were disappearing. And I thought, somebody is stealing the rings. Uh, so they started really watching all the people in this department as they went out and checking their lunch boxes and, and checking them over. No rings. No, but they're still disappearing. So it's really quite a mystery. What is going on with these rings? 
So they start doing some detective work. Now, I'm not sure who it was who did the detecting, but it was an interesting situation. They, just, they, they were looking at everything from this department, trying to figure out what was happening. And what they discovered was that there was a big increase in the use of toilet paper in this department. So they started investigating, and sure enough, they found out that there was someone working in the department who was very disgruntled. It was a woman who worked in the department, and she was very disgruntled because her husband, who also worked at Balfour, didn't get a promotion that she thought he should get. And so to get back at the company, she was taking the rings, wrapping them up in toilet paper, and flushing them down the toilet. So, so once they figured this out, and she confessed to flushing down the rings, then uh, fortunately, this, went, this whole piping situation uh, went down to a big trap. And they opened up the trap, and sure enough, out came all these gold <laughs> Balfour rings uh, that had been flushed down the toilet and caught in the trap. Uh, but the part of the story that, that impressed me was that it, the story said that Mr. Balfour talked with this individual personally and did not fire her. He was forgiven and, and allowed to keep her job. Can I add to the Absolutely. People don't realize this, but that almost put Balfour Company out of business because we couldn't get enough gold. We only, the yeah, government only allowed you so much gold to work with. Mm -hmm. And with all this gold that was gone and had to be replaced, Balfour Company almost. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the thing that you see, that was significantly after Mr. Balfour's time. The, uh, the actual event happened. Oh, did it? Yes. Oh, okay. Then I, I have the story wrong. It was in the, in the 70s. Uh, it was in the 70s. Really. Okay, so that would have, would that have Mr. Yeager's time or after uh, him? Yeager's Mr. Time. Was it Scott? Yeager's time. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, the part about Mr. Mr. Balfour forgiving you know, is not. Yeah, well, I, that's, what I, that's why I'm happy you guys are here. Yeah. Like I said, I never worked there. Uh, I only went by the research that I could find, and I could not find the story. It, it was a newspaper article, but I wasn't able to put my hands on it. So I had to just, uh, yeah, go by uh, what I remembered. Yes, you did. Yes. Oh, okay. When people talk, just like on Oprah, I'm going to put the microphone in your hand. Because now it is time for that. Uh, it's time for your remembrances of Balfour. Uh, some of you probably have some pleasant memories. Maybe you have some not so pleasant memories, but we would love to hear them uh, as, our, as part of our tribute to the Balfour Company. So uh, who wants to go first? No one, huh? All right. I gotta, just gonna, I, gotta, I gotta turn mine off before I give you yours. And hold it right up to your mouth because you have to be very close. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jim Keenan. I worked with Balfour Company from 1963 till 1987. The third day I was, I was employed, my car was parked out in the back by the old KSC. We didn't have much parking for, for the employees. And it was driving rain, and uh, this car pulled up, and the gentleman offered me a ride. And I said, No, I said, I'm just going to walk. No, no, get in, I'll take you to the front door. Never met him before, met him several times afterwards. That was Mr. Balfour. <laughs> that was my first meeting of him. And we would see him walk in the plant from time to time, and it'd be funny because when he would walk down the aisle, people would really work hard. <laughs> As he went by, they slowed down a little. <laughs> Maybe half of them were worth it. Anyone else? Oh, come on. I know you get stories. <laughs> yeah, we'll write a few mouths and close because uh, that's going to work. Do I have to go up there? Yes. Nope, yeah. you can do it from right there. If you want to. You can come up front or you can do it from your seat. Or... <laughs> I worked at Balfour's during the 70s, the middle 70s. And we worked, we were a bunch 
Oh, that's my old boss, Bob. <laughs> 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 and we, we were just a bunch of um, girls. Most of us were all young mothers. And we worked uh, part-time. And we did it because, well, naturally, we had to supplement. I had two kids, and um, so I would work nights. My husband worked days. And, um, but it was only a part-time thing, which was wonderful because we didn't work like during the summers. And Belfort's always rehired almost all of us. And I want to thank you. You taught me how to write sides of rings, put the engrave all the uh, initials. And um, that's my memories of it. It was fun. And like you said, if some boss comes by, he can bob over there. We can <laughs> start talking. Right, yeah, we can work a little bit. Work a little bit harder, but um, it was a good time. And it was a time for us young mothers. That was our time to get together. And it was because it was mostly all young women who worked to supplement their income. So, I can thank you for that. Okay, very good. Hi, my name is Dick Almeida, and I worked for Balfour for 35 years. Uh, great years. And a lot of my friends that I still have are Balfour people. Uh, they were a good company, uh, always had a job, always had a pay. Um, that's my memories of Balfour. Well, I'm Michael Hi, my name's Leo Langlois. As maybe some of you remember me. I was at one time president of the Recreation Relief and Recreation Association. And uh, do you all remember the Christmas parties? Oh, yes. Christmas parties, all the Christmas parties? Yeah. Well, we, used, we were so big that we used to have seven of them, yes. right? And as president, I had to go to every one of them. <laughs> the meal was always the same. Each party the same meal. So I used to say to Warren, I said, for Christ's sakes, make something different for me, would you? <laughs> so he did. So that's my recollection, and I met an awful lot of people in my 35 years there. And I enjoyed working with every one of them. And these people right here in the front row, who I've known for 35 years or more. And they're all friends. We'll get together. We talk to one another. And by the way, all you felt for people, we have something called the gold dusters. I'm a past president from the gold dusters. And I'll tell you, if you don't, if you're not a member, why don't you join? We meet once a month, and I'll tell you, we have a good time. We have entertainment that comes in and so forth. So think it over and try to make it down there to some of our meetings. Okay, thank you. I have two quick trivia questions for you. Mr. Lloyd G. Balfour, what is the G? Oh, that's real. Right. Okay. Now, who here knows what sandbobbing is? <coughs> okay, tell us what sandbobbing is first. Sandbobbing is, is the dirtiest job there is in Belfort. It needs some like. When, when a man, well, what it did, it was polishing metal. Like, what it was, it was the dirtiest job in Belfort. And what they did was this was done at the North Adderall plant. And uh, the bobber would it'd be mud, actually mud. And that's what he would polish trophies with and, and uh, bowls and so forth. So that, that's what it was. And if you were, you were a bobber, I'll tell you, you didn't get paid enough. <laughs> was it actual mud? Pardon? Was it actual mud or was it? It was actually mud. It was a, a, a mud. Water and, and wall was on the Nah, yeah, I'm just going to get the water. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the mud was put on a wheel, a spinning wheel, and spun it. You can probably imagine it flying around. Yeah, probably the dirtiest job in the place. The best material for the sand bobbing operation is this walrus. This is walrus hide. 
And as you can see, they'll be cut into a circle, they make a wheel out of it, and use that for sand bottom. But that's pretty interesting that we actually have a piece of walrus hide from the Battle Forge. A lot of times when they were working with that, they were working on trophies, and they were working in a very strange sitting position, pulling the walrus, the hide itself against the material, against the wheel, rather, or the trophy against the wheel. So that's interesting that we have walrus hide. Probably a little difficult getting walrus hide today. I want to show you another interesting uh, uh, Balfour uh, item, which you may or may not be familiar with, but I don't know if you can even see it. But what this is, is a little sheet metal bank. And it says on the front, Balfour Budget Bank for class rings. These were bought in the 30s during the Depression. And they would hand them out to high school students. And there was, a, uh, there was a slot in the top for dimes. And you push your dimes in there, and there's a little dial on it, on the back, uh, that tells you how you're doing. Five bucks. You had to save up five bucks for your high school rank. And the little bank wouldn't open until there was five bucks worth of dimes. You couldn't get in there without smashing the bank to pieces until there was five bucks worth of things. So that was kind of a, a clever ploy, I think, during those those years. The kids would just slip their dimes in there and uh, it was couldn't get them out without uh, a lot of mayhem to the bank. And the thing would keep coming for you. It was a little window on the front that would tell you how much was in it. And when you got to five bucks, the little patch on the back would open up and you could take out the money and buy your rent. How much do you want to, Josh? Hmm? <laughs> uh, I, I haven't put any in there. <laughs> That's for him. But the uh, bank cost 10. <laughs> well, I, I think that concludes my comments. Uh, if there's anyone else who wants to share a, uh, a memory, I'll give you a last, last chance. If she can sit there. Sure, you can sit right there and just take the microphone to work. Just hold it up close to your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the Depression, 1937, uh, Balfour called a high school and asked for a good commercial area student. That was me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I sent it and I worked there until I got married and had children. And then I came back after that. And I stayed in for another 26 years. <laughs> but I was the first student that was hired after me. Depression. And I still got my social security card to prove it. <laughs> Anyone else on the last chance? No, I got one more. Um, I just wanted to say one little thing. I only worked there for six years, which is nothing compared to some of you people I know. But I always used to love it. We were known as Jewelry's Finest Craftsmen. And I don't think anybody's mentioned that tonight. But over the door, when you walked in every day, it said, quality walks in every day. And, and another thing that was so great that made a big impression on me when I first went there was, it seemed like everybody's whole family worked there. Nobody in my family worked there. And I was just baffled by how this went on. I worked next to a girl who's had two aunts and her mother and her grandmother all working there at the same time. And that's the way it went. It was always that way. And another thing that always impressed me too was I used to hear stories about those Christmas parties you were talking about, how Mr. Balfour would go around and wear a red vest and shake hands with everyone at Christmas time. And then after Mr. Balfour left, Bucky Gay used to do it. And I was there when Bucky Gay would come around and he'd wear a red vest and he would shake hands with everybody and wish them a Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. well, that's one of I actually never worked at Balfour or anything, but I just have a little thing about the rings. I graduated from St. Elizabeth's Nursing School and in 62, I think. Anyway, I remember the ring cost $15. Yes. And I, I had to like scrounge and borrow to get the fifteen dollars, I mean that was a lot of money in those yes. days, and of course, it's a gorgeous ring. And then when my boys went to high school here, um, back in whatever the eighties and then whenever they, I mean the rings were like 
don't know, were over $100. Yeah. So it was just like, I always remembered that because I was crying because I didn't think I could get the ring for $15. But I got it. Anyway. Do you know the Bellfoy is back in Avalon now? I understood that some of them had gone to. Uh, some of them come back to Providence. Like, no, you know, no, they, yeah. they're actually back in Avalon. I worked at the high school and they come in. Where's their current employees? Are okay. Back. Oh, okay. 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 Okay.